Okay, thank you for organizing this. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sachi. Uh, I think you have covered everything. The only thing left is I'll have to change the sex. That is it. I think you have covered everything. Nothing is there. So, anyways, this is the uh, slide which shows a schematic diagram of uh, male hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis and its homeostasis, and uh, which, which is because of the environmental inputs uh, in the form of uh, there are glucocorticoids and the prolactin, inflammatory cytokines, endorphins, and uh, exogenous sex steroids. All of them they work on the uh, arcuate nucleus, and then again, all of them are released and they work on the medio basal uh, hypothalamus and they act on the GNRH neurons and that is again GNRH is released and that acts on the pituitary and uh, gonadotropins in the form of LH and FSH they are secreted. LH works on the uh, testicles that is Leydig cells that secretes the testosterone which increases the intratesticular testosterone and also released into the blood and uh, this testosterone and FSH they all of them they work on the Sertoli cells and they uh, initiate and maintain the spermatogenesis that is how this is the schematic diagram again testosterone that are having a negative feedback and as you know the prevalence of male hypogonadism that has been estimated I, I, I mean to say all of the hypogonadism it's not only hyper hypo or hypo hypo so it's about six to twelve percent and if it is left untreated it can lead to six cell death dysfunction infertility anemia osteoporosis fracture myopathy frailty gynecomastia and psychological issues that happen and there is also reduced quality in the life. So defining this problem, as you know, already has been discussed, that is hypogonadism means it is just impaired testicular function that can result from primary uh, disorders or can be from the secondary disorders. And secondary hypogonadism again can be uh, congenital and acquired. Congenital means it can be anosmic, that is Kalman syndrome, and it can be normosmic, that is isolated hypogonotropic hypogonadism. And acquired hypogonotropic hypogonadism can be caused by other causes, that is hyperprolactinemia, certain drugs, infectious pituitary lesions, trauma, pituitary and brain irradiation, and exhausting exercise, alcohol abuse, illicit drug use, systemic diseases in the form of hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, histiocytosis. And of the several factors, what have been discussed, that the responsible for the male infertility, if you see the hypogonotropic hypogonadism, that is definitely a treatable cause of infertility, maybe less number, but definitely is a treatable cause of infertility. So most of the idiopathic hypogonotropic hypogonadism is because of the Kalman syndrome and uh, maybe 40% is just normosmic hypogonotropic idiopathic hypogonotropic hypogonadism and amongst all of them, two third are because of the sporadic and one third is inherited cause. So this uh, slide says actually we need to know something about the clinical pictures. Everything has been discussed, but the male hypogonadism, uh, you need to know whether it is pre-pivotal hypogonadism or post-pivotal hypogonadism. So normally any patient having pre-pivotal hypogonadism, they have a disproportionate height like unocardial you know, stature and they have small testes, small penis, lack of normal scrotal ruby and pigmentation, small prostate, scanty facial, axillary pubic hair, high-pitched voice. On the other hand, the post-pivotal hypogonadism, they have a normal structure and proportions are normal and testicular volume may be normal too, slightly low, penile size may be normal. There is normal scrotal ruby and pigmentation, size will be normal, there is thinning of the facial, axillary and pubic hair and voice should be normal. But common uh, symptoms which are common to both these, uh, both the hypogonadism is gynecomastia, infertility, lack of libido, low bone mineral density, loss of muscle mass, increase in the fat and of course uh, uh, other things. And the features of androgen deficiency, as you know, it is uh, in the adolescent, it can be lack, delay, or suggestion of the pubertal sexual maturation. And in case of adult, of course, infertility is a major issue and loss of libido and quality of life is also very poor. So if you look at the hypo-hypo that is considered as idiopathic hypogonotropic hypogonadism, when there is an isolated GNR, GNRA secretion deficiency in individuals over the 18 years age, but if it is less than eight years, definitely you have to rule out the CDGP that has been discussed by uh, Dr. Chitavar. And low blood testosterone levels and low pituitary hormone levels, they confirm the diagnosis of hypogonotropic hypogonadism. And in case of Kalman syndrome, definitely you should go for a cerebral MRI, which can show anomalous morphology or even the absence of the olfactory bulb. 
So next slide says the diagnosis, how you diagnose all the laboratory evaluation, as you know, the hormonal profiles in the form of LH, FSH, prolactin, testosterone, of course, thyroid function is also very important. And uh, also you should go for uh, other tests like, uh, just a moment, uh, seminal fluid examination, karyotyping, testicular biopsy. However, the endocrine society guidelines says in case of male, uh, in case of males, just after puberty, the diagnosis of hypogonadism should be based on symptoms plus signs of hypogonadism plus presence of low testosterone level at least measured on two occasions and there are of course certain uh, other tests additional tests that is required suppose if you are suspecting ch in that case you need to have a HTH stimulation test gnrh analog test which is done by giving lipride that is 10 microgram per kg subcutaneously which is done to distinguish between the true idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and cdgp and hypo hypo will have a subnormal subnormal response response after lipride injection and CDG, CDGP will have a pivotal response. And this GNRH test that is based basically on the principle that for our sample that normally indicate the gonadotropin reserve and 24 hour sample that judges the uh, gonadal response to the endogenous gonadotropin levels. The sample to be taken at zero minutes should be LH, FSH and four hour also it is LH and FSH and at 24 hours it is LH, FSH and the testosterone should be taken. And second, uh, other testing that is very important is the testicular tissue testing is very important. That is very important in case of crypto orchidism. In that case, whether you need to know whether testicular test tissue is really there or not. Otherwise, how will you treat again uh, later on? So that, that is clarified by the SCG test. If the testes are not palpable, we can go for the SCG test and we should measure the testosterone, thera testosterone response. Diagnosis is definitely concluded by the MRI uh, that is used for pituitary prolactin and craniopharyngioma. And in Kalman syndrome, cerebral MRI can show anomalous morphology, absence of olfactory bulb, and it therefore plays an important role in presumptive diagnosis. Next comes the management. As you know, patients with hypogonadism, they're typically treated with sex steroids. That is for the maintenance of the sexual characters, libido, and quality of life. However, the goal of the treatment should be to promote the uh, development and uh, uh, development of the maintain to maintain the secondary sexual characteristics and to maintain the normal sexual function. And also to build the sustained uh, normal bone and muscle mass and to assist in the proper psychosocial adjustment of the adolescent with hypogonadism. Fertility of should be explored when fertility is required. So as you know, most hypogonad young men, they want to be fertile, fertile definitely. Thus, it is very important to remember that the fertility of men with hypo-hypo is only reduced and that fertility may be restored through hormone therapy. So the fertility of the patient with hypo-hypo that can be restored through the use of GNRS when cases uh, have a hypothalamic origin or maybe more commonly with the use of gonadotropins. You know about the various gonadotropins that is used either from the urinary source or the recombinant source and they are presently available also. The urinary gonadotropins, the forms are produced from the urine of the menopausal women that is known as HMG and we have also HCG and HMG contains both urinary FSS and LH and another commonly used urinary gonadotropin that is highly purified known as FSS. So these are all the formulations and uh, normally what should happen, there should be high intratesticular testosterone levels which is necessary for the uh, initiation and maintenance of this Spermatogenesis, and that is definitely achieved by injecting SCG. So the first phase is known as the induction phase. So after the all the baseline investigation, so we have to inject the SCG that, that is should be started with administration of about 1,000 to 2,500 IU weekly for 8 to 12 weeks or until the testicular atrophy is reversed or the testosterone levels are really high enough to induce spermatogenesis. That is also followed by addition of subcutaneous injection of the recombinant and FSH in a dose of 150 IU three times per week to support and then maintain the spermatogenesis. This is very crucial for the following testosterone levels to increase in certain cases. Even SCG alone also can induce spermatogenesis. So in the individuals who do not have sufficient endogenous FS in that case, treatment should be continued with co-administration of 75 to 150 IU of HMG three times per week, at least for 18 months as the presence of FSH, which is crucial for stimulating and maintaining spermatogenesis.
So this combined treatment that provides a considerable testicular growth in most of the patient in addition to spermatogenesis that happens in 90% of the patient. And the therapy should be continued at least for nine to 18 months and GnRH infusion pump also another mode of the formulation or uh, the therapy if the injection therapy has failed, but normally it is very expensive and it is also very inconvenient. So we don't use it normally. We just give us scheduled SCG and HMG. Men on gonadotropin therapy they should learn the self-injection so that they can inject themselves and monitoring the side effect is very uh, side effect of the therapy is very important in the form of bloating fatigue and maybe sometimes uh, pain in the breast and look for the evidence of this spermatogenesis every three to four months and testosterone normally should be normalized in three months after starting the SCG therapy. An appreciable spermatosis normally is achieved at nine to 12 months. And regardless of the hormone used for the treatment, the total number of sperm uh, uh, usually remains below the threshold. And there are, of course, certain predictors of the treatment success, like increased baseline testicular volume, no history of cryptoarchidism, history of sexual maturation, and if no previous testosterone therapy was given. So even individuals with testicular volume of 3 ml also, they can be benefited with this drug. Next comes the, what is the outcome of this treatment? Vast majority of the patient, they will be able to conceive and although 71% of the patient subsequent fertility have sperm concentration that is considerably lower, although they become pregnant. And 10% of the patient may maintain normal serum testosterone level after suggestion of the endocrine therapy, but in patients who have developed hypogonadism before therapy that can take a longer period. They may need a one or two years of therapy to achieve sperm production. Even spontaneous conception is also achieved within six to nine months of the therapy, but can go up to two years also. If spontaneous pregnancy doesn't occur after 20 months or eight months after achieving a sperm concentration of at least five billion, then assisted reproductive technology may be considered to achieve pregnancy. So there are certain ranges of ART in the form of IUI, IVF, then XC. So acquisition of the viable forms can be taken from the ejaculate or maybe uh, uh, hypo hypo patient with persistent agospermia despite long periods of hormone therapy takes form directly from the testis through the testicular sperm ejaculation that is called as TESI. Or testicular micro dissection also can be done depending on the woman's potential for the pregnancy and the quality and quantity of the sperm. IUI, as you know, there is uh, there is a good option for uh, the uh, for, for the uh, pregnancy. So in that case, also you can go for IUI, and IUI is uh, less expensive and more natural way to conceive. So before going for IUI, definitely go for SHG, SHG to rule out or to, uh, to rule out tubal block. And ICSI also is the treatment of choice for those patients who have completed at least one year of therapy and exit sperm concentration less than one million, or those who have sperm concentration concentration more than 2 million but have failed to achieve impregnation after 20 months. Contraception is advisable for cases where pregnancy is achieved, uh, uh, achieved after the spermatogenesis and may continue after the therapy stops. So contraception should be explained to the patient. In up to 10% of the cases, the patient exhibits a uh, sustained sperm response and adequate serum testosterone levels even after the completion of withdrawal of the medication. So this is normally called as the hyper hypogonadotropic hypogonadism reversal. The mechanism in these cases uh, is definitely not known, uh, but it appears to be a neuronal plasticity in GnRH producing cells. And the recent advances uh, regarding this topic is uh, uh, in 2010, there was a FSH analog that was known as corifolytropin in alpha therapy, which is when combined, combined with the SCG treatment can significantly increase the testicular volume and induce spermatogenesis. It was approved in the year 2010 and patient in this study, they remained agospermic though with a normalized testosterone level after 16 weeks of SCG treatment, underwent 50 SCG therapy and it is a long acting um, FSS analog. You can give it once weekly along with SCG therapy. So case presentation, I think I am not going to do because I will be late. Uh, uh, if you want, I can do it. 
uh, a 25 year old gentleman who presented with endocrine clinic with history of tiredness, reduced libido and inability to father a child uh, that is for more than a year. And he had a child with a previous partner and his current female partner had already been fully evaluated by the fertility specialist in 2007. He took anabolic steroid during bodybuilding training, but stated that he had symptoms of tiredness, reduced libido before then and 2011, he stopped taking the steroid because he wanted to father a child. After a year of no success, he and his partner, they decided for fertility treatment on examination. He was absolutely normal. There was no previous investigation result to suggest that patient had hypogonadism, predated anabolic steroid use. After the baseline investigation, he had gonadotropin therapy. He had three to four monthly investigation to monitor for the side effects, hormonal response to the treatment, and for evidence of this spermatogenesis. And once adequate spermatogenesis was confirmed by serial semen analysis, but still there was no conception with non-assisted conception and his semen samples were present for the assisted conception treatment. And then uh, uh, the results of the baseline and follow-up investigations are baseline taste, rebuilt hypogonotropic uh, uh, hypogonadism as well as azospermia on two separate occasions. And MRI showed nothing that was normal. Appreciable spermatogenesis was observed at nine to 12 months after starting the gonotropin therapy. He consisted of subcutaneous SCG uh, gonotropin, that SCG 1500 IU three times a week until serum testosterone level was normal. A negative semen analysis prompted the addition of subcutaneous uh, recombinant FSS at a dose of 150 three times a week, week while the dose of SCG was reduced to 1500 IU twice a week. At six months, the SCG was stopped temporarily because of there was an increase in the PSA level which returned to normal within six weeks. Then SCG was restarted at a lower dose that is 1500 IU once a week. Combined therapy was continued until after appreciable levels of spermatogenesis for non-assisted conception and for semen freezing and assisted conception treatment. Then the recombinant FSS was stopped when non-assisted conception failed and enough frozen semen samples were stored. After several months of unsuccessful non-assisted conception, the patient subsequently achieved conception through the assisted uh, conception treatment on the second atom using the stored frozen sample. Then he had a child and after stopping the gonadotropin, his testosterone uh, uh, levels that declined. Then finally patient was on testosterone replacement therapy. So the take home message is the male hypogonotropic hypogonadism is defined as uh, reduced reduced uh, androgen levels uh, because of uh, that because the testes do not produce androgens and the sperm and is the consequence of uh, maybe congenital or acquired diseases that affect the hypothalamus and or the pituitary gland. So signs and symptoms of hypo hypo that can vary according to the age that depends on the adolescent age or the adult age and diagnosis requires the determination of all the hormonal profiles in the form of FSH, LS, testosterone, and MRI scan also should be done. Uh, um, MRI scan of the brain and cilla should be considered, and androgen replacement should be done when fertility is not required. But when fertility is required, definitely in that case, you have to go for a scheduled treatment with SCG and HMG. So, it's hypogonotropic hypogonadism represents one of the rare conditions in which specific medical treatment that can reverse first infertility and the induction and maintenance of both spermatogenesis and androgen production, they are achieved by exogenous administration of gonotropins. And results are really good. And uh, uh, spermatogenesis even has been seen in 80 to 90% of the cases. But after just after withdrawing treatment, maybe everything will be over and patients should be continued with the injectable testosterone therapy for maintenance of the androgenization. Thank you very much for your kind attention.